Hey guys, welcome to our study of the Cold War. We're going to start our first section here with a study of containment. Now our study of the Cold War picks up right where World War II leaves off with the, uh, the Allies, the winning countries, deciding on how to deal with the, the Axis powers, the countries that lose the war. And so the very first thing we look at here is the United States and the Soviet Union both being major superpowers, both massive uh, countries who were on the Allied side, obviously. Uh, emerge as leaders of the world, uh, both economically and militarily. Um, big differences, though, between our countries in regards to our uh, economics and our property, how we deal with elections, and then uh, basically how the people feel, how the people of the United States feel about Russia and vice versa. You'll notice that in property, in the uh, in the in the state of communism, the state or what's known as the government, um, they they are the ones who control. Um, the property, they control the economic activity, they control the elections, uh, not allowing any kind of uh, opposing parties like the United States. We have all kinds of different political parties um, in Russia that's not allowed. And then again, how we here in America feel about the not or the uh, Soviets' um, early suspicions due to their early alliance, the non aggression pact with Hitler. And then on the flip side of that, um, Russians, uh, especially Stalin, very suspicious of the West in the United States since we did not um, give away any information about our nuclear capabilities. Now following World War I, there was a creation of a body, a governing body, called the League of Nations, which the United States was not involved in and essentially was extremely weak um, and it went defunct and that was one of the reasons why World War II was allowed to happen. Another governing body was created uh, right before World War II is, is over, and that's called the United Nations. The United States does join this. The Soviet Union um, joins this. And um, basically, the two countries grapple back and forth and, and use this as, as a way to spread their influence over these other weaker, smaller nations. Um, the first meeting of the Allied leaders, uh, United States, Russia, and England, takes, takes place at Yalta. The slide here shows you that uh, the Potsdam Conference, Stalin refuses to uh, follow through with promises that he made at Yalta. Um, and there's a reason for that, possibly because of the change in leadership that takes place at, at Potsdam. So here's what we have in, in 1945, um, the first meeting of the Big Three, uh, Churchill for England, President Roosevelt, obviously the United States, and then Stalin for Russia. At Potsdam, just a few short months later, same year, uh, we have a new prime minister for England, that's Clement Attlee. Um, Churchill's party had lost the elections, and so he loses his position as prime minister. Clement Attlee takes over. April 12, 1945, President Roosevelt dies. Vice President Truman takes over, and he's the new president. So the only consistent person here, the constant, is Stalin. So I think possibly, maybe, uh, he thinks he can exercise his power over the two newcomers and uh, go back against some of the promises he made at at Yalta. Now Truman obviously uh, objects to this um, and uh, wants Stalin, wants to hold Stalin to his promises, especially the promise of free elections for people in these new areas that have developed as a result of World War II. Um, Truman wants to be sure that democratic nations are able to develop after, after having been released from this Nazi control. Um, Stalin, on the other hand, not so much. Um, at Yalta, Stalin makes the uh, suggestion that in order to pay for the war, Germany should fork over the money, much like they did after World War I. Truman, on the other hand, um, again objects to that. He wants to see Germany get back on its feet, and he wants the United States to be the one to help Germany get back on its feet. Well, you can't, you can't have both Germany paying out billions of dollars and Germany bouncing back from the war happening at the same time. So Truman suggests that the Allies take reparations from the four areas that they control. So we see here Russia controlling this part of Germany, uh, England con con controlling this part of Germany, France has these two small regions, and then the United States has this part. So those would be the four areas that the four or the three big countries, excuse me, four big countries would uh, claim their reparations from. Notice a large area for the United States, large area for, for, uh, for Russia. Um, Truman made these suggestions, again, mainly for economic, uh, U.S. economic um, capabilities. We wanted to be sure that we continued, or Truman wanted to be sure that the United States continued his 
uh, economic growth that we experienced uh, in World War II. You know, World War II is the reason why the um, United States gets out of the Great Depression with wartime production. And so, once again, with Europe being destroyed by war, the United States has an opportunity to continue its, uh, its economic growth, both in manufacturing and in agriculture. And, and Truman wants to be sure that the United States is providing what Europe needs. Again, as I've already said, the Soviet Union does emerge as an economic and uh, military strength, much like the United States. Unfortunately, the one thing standing in the Soviet Union's way is that they have a lot of devastation at home um, from the war. And so that's one of the main reasons why Stalin felt justified in claiming money from Germany, because Germany had enacted all this damage on Europe, especially in, in Russia. So without, with, with, with Truman standing in the way, Stalin is not able to um, get the reparations that he hopes for. So the next best thing is to install Soviet-style governments in the countries of Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Poland. Essentially, those countries that had been controlled by um, the Nazi Germany uh, during World War II, and these countries become known as satellite nations. And with the development of these satellite nations, uh, Truman and essentially Western Europe, England, France, have a fear of the spread of communism, which, which prompts this new policy, uh, Truman's policy, known as containment, uh, taking steps to prevent any further extension of communist rule. Uh, Stalin promised that those countries, those satellite nations, would be sovereign. They would just have Soviet influence. Uh, in reality, it's just literally an extension of Soviet Russia. Uh, up and up right up to the borders that were controlled by uh, Western European countries um, with the satellite nations um, all the way up to splitting basically splitting Germany in half and then on the other side we have Western European countries holding the other half of Germany we have essentially divided West Europe into two uh, zones Western Europe Eastern Europe with Western being democratic and Eastern being communist Churchill makes a famous visit to the United States and speaks at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Many of you might end up uh, at, at Westminster College, um, very well known for this speech. It's where he gives his famous Iron Curtain speech. Um, he essentially has told the world that an Iron Curtain is descending upon England with Stalin's move and the creation of these satellite nations. So when Stalin hears of uh, Churchill's words through this speech, he calls this uh, and a basically a call to war. Essentially, he's saying that that Western Europe wants to go to war with Russia, uh, even though Stalin himself earlier said that capitalism and communism cannot exist together, and they will eventually go to war. That war is inevitable, inevitable between the two uh, styles of government. Here you see, in fact, the Iron Curtain that, that uh, Churchill was referring to, and this line divides Western Europe from. Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, yeah, a lot of barricades set up uh, across this entire part of uh, of Europe at the time. Um, today, it's uh, it's a historic trail, and I think for all for all of you uh, cycling uh, fanatics out there, you can ride the Iron Curtain Trail um, up and down throughout Europe. Guys, thanks for listening. Take care.